Welcome to the Ad Nauseam Podcast, where classical gourmands everywhere can finally get their fill. Join us for a delectable discussion of Greco-Roman civilization stretching from the Minoans and Mycenaeans through the Renaissance and right down to the present. And now, ladies and gentlemen, here are your hosts, Dr. David Noe and Dr. Jeff Winkle. Welcome, listeners, to episode 56 of the Ad Nauseam Podcast. Wow, 56. Can you believe that we've, we've gotten this far, Dave? I never thought we'd get this far. No, but we're, we're keep rolling. We're, 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 we're building steam. It's going to keep rolling. That's like, right. People are, how do we say it, uh, uh, catching on and catching up. Exactly right. So we appreciate all the people out there who are, who are listening. My name, as always, my name is always uh, <laughs> Dr. Jeff Winkle. I'm here with my good friend, co-host, confidant, Dr. David Noe. How you doing, Dave? I'm doing pretty well. It's just a little bit different time here at Vomitorium West, recording in the afternoon. Feeling like a little bit of a different vibe for you? It is a little bit different vibe. You know, by the evening, we're a little bit worn, a little careworn, the trials and travails of life. It's true. We got to to work hard to to keep the energy going. Uh, In the afternoon, a little more rested. Yeah. And a little bit of a chill in the air. Yeah, exactly. So all this, I think, bodes very well for for the episode ahead of us. Well, we'll see. But, you know, as um, as, is it Marshall? I don't cook for cooks, right? We should just let the audience decide how it went. Exactly. You're right. Let's, okay. Uh, let's back it off. Hey, I got a, I got a shout out. Let's to, hear it. Stars. And this goes out to Suzanne Williams. Yeah, she's been uh, waiting a while for this shout out. She has. And this is well earned. And I you have talk to say. about super fan. Oh, man. Yes. Uh, we love Suzanne, all her, her comments. And, and she's somewhere near the top of the pack, I have to say. She, oh, yes. If, if not at the top. She sent this brilliant, you remember this brilliant faux cover? Yes. Something she photoshopped or something of... The frogs and a book that you and I were going to write. Exactly. And scratch and sniff Latin. <laughs> this is brilliant. It was great. It was it was funny. It was clever. So I'm. She's clearly thrown down the gauntlet. She's raised the bar. Whatever, that's, that's whatever right. phrase you want to plug in there. In terms of super fandom. Yes. Well, who is Suzanne? Well, Suzanne okay. writes to us. She says, "I'm returning to teaching Latin in Northwest Arkansas this fall after staying home with my kids for several years. I fell in love with Latin and couldn't ever get away from it." So I ended up minoring it in it at Florida State for fun. Of course. And that led to a teaching job in Florida and then in Texas. Uh, my husband was in the military, so moving around a lot. I found your podcast to help me refresh as I get back into the game and it has not disappointed me. I love that. Yeah. I love the way that she talks about Latin as the game. Now, yeah. I know it's an expression people use. Are you in the game? Right. But yeah. as I get back into the game, that's the right attitude to have about teaching Latin. Exactly. She's like, put me in coach. I'm, I'm ready. ready to play exactly. today. It's yes, Dire Straits. Uh, that's uh, John Fogarty. Center, oh. uh, center field. Sorry, yep. sorry. Yep. So Same thank around. you, Suzanne, for being such a loyal listener, for encouraging us so much in our work, and uh, keeping the flame alive out yes. there, right? absolutely. We love it. So Dave, I got to eat some crow this week. Okay. Before we launch into today's topic, which we haven't mentioned yet. Let me uh, pull up a fork here and yeah. uh, take some photos. So uh, apparently last week when we were talking about the state mottos. What's a motto with you? I made this very bold claim that... Uh, Minnesota, I think I said something like, the only state that should have a hockey team actually doesn't have a hockey team. Yeah, well, you, were, you were doing your Jesse Ventura voice, right? Minnesota. <laughs> right, right. I think I was, yeah. So I was completely wrong. I mean, I think I was right in that they, they were the North Stars for many years. Don't, don't try to listen. Don't try listen. to save it. You can't okay. salvage anything right. here. So I'm not a huge hockey fan. I think that's probably obvious. No. Right? So I, I thank the correction, um, but I'm also a little irritated because I learned that they might have the worst name for a team of all time. They're the Minnesota Wild. The Minnesota Wild. Wild. And so it says, Can you turn an adjective into mm, the name of a team? I suppose you can, but you shouldn't. No, you shouldn't. The Florida Ferocious. Right. It's, it's, like, it's like they tried to pick a name that wouldn't offend anyone and ends up irritating everybody. Yes, you're right, because right. it couldn't be a Native American or some kind of animal or something like that. Right. The Minnesota Wild. Wild. That's right. terrible. So, But I was wrong. Okay. And I, I sit corrected. Speaking of eating crow. Yeah. I did a little research. On, on eating crow? Yeah, because I was relishing this moment. And uh, the, the eating crow, right? <laughs> yeah. It's gustatory. We're gourmands. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Right. So, so what, do you, what do you got? So here's a quote from somewhere on the interwebs. Some language experts say this expression comes from English writer Rudyard Kipling. Kipling uses an image of eating crow in his 1885 short story, The Strange Ride of Maroby Jukes. Hmm. So, Jeff, you're going to want to you know, get out a pencil and take some notes uh, yeah, here after I, I should. The, the hockey performance. Yeah. Maroby Jukes was a European colonist in India. While traveling one day, he falls into a sand pit and cannot escape. Another man, a native Indian, is also trapped in the same sand pit. The Indian man stays alive by catching wild crows and eating them. Clever, right? Mm-hmm. Maroby is full of pride as he yells, I shall never eat crow. 
I see. So okay, eating crow would mean to swallow one's pride. Exactly. Yes. Swallow one's pride, swallow some crow, yep. and you know, live to fight another day. Interesting. So that's what you've done, Winkle. I have. Trapped in the pit of um, hockey error, right. you live another day. Right. When I first learned this, I was shaking my fist a little bit. You know, I'm not going to admit to this. I was Correct. not going to eat that crow, but now I'm, I'm uh, you know, serve it up. Smart move. Yeah, I guess That's so. what makes you a good co-host. Yeah. And you have the opening quote, do you not? Yes. Uh, so we sh- should we tell people what we're talking yes, about? we should. We're talking about... You have to see the wizard, the wonderful wizard of Oz. You find the ears of wizard of Oz, if ever a wizard of Oz. If ever a wizard of Oz, the wizard of Oz is one because, 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 because. Because of the wonderful things he does. The famous oracle at Delphi, uh, one of the, the the most famous oracle in uh, the ancient Greek world, if not one of the most famous oracles in the world. Absolutely. So, so I'm a, um, I'll read the opening quote. This Let's comes, hear it. This comes from an article called "The Oracular Process" by a certain Herbert Huffman from 2007. He writes, "The oracular temple of Apollo at Delphi is described by Plutarch as the most ancient in time and the most famous in repute in the Greek in the Greek world." More modestly, Joseph Fontenrose observes that from the 6th century BC, it was the most popular of Greek oracles, attracting clients from all Hellas and beyond. However, such was its prestige that most Hellenes after 500 BC placed its foundations in the earliest days of the world. Before Apollo took possessions, they said, Gaia and her daughter Themis had spoken oracles at Pytho. For that matter, it is the longest enduring and best known centralized oracular shrine in the ancient Mediterranean and ancient Near Eastern world. In the almost three decades since the publication of the last comprehensive study of the Delphic Oracle, that by Fontaine Rose, nothing has emerged to alter his observation that, if we look elsewhere in the ancient world, we find no example of an established inspiration oracle like the Delphic and other Apolline establishments. Hmm. So high praise. High praise. Right. So basically, if I can summarize, because this is some excellent academic prose by Mr. Huffman, mm-hmm. the Oracle of Apollo at Delphi, this is the one, right? It's an established, inspired establishment. Did I just say established establishment? <laughs> you did. Well, I'm, tripp- <laughs> I'm tripping it up today. Could you summarize the article for us? <laughs> I think between the lines, he's saying there were, I think there was many oracles. Competitors. There. There, were, there were many competitors, but none as established and long lasting and as influential as the Oracle at Delphi. Got it. Yep. Got it. Got it. So what are we bringing the listener today? Well, we're going to break it down. We're okay. going to talk about what an Oracle was, how you would approach an Oracle, what kind of answers and questions did the Oracle give and, and receive, and uh, get a better understanding of kind of its place in the ancient Greek world. It's a great story. Makes sense. Makes mm-hmm. good sense. So as we get right into it, we have to ask the first question, right? That of definition. What do we mean by an oracle? Right. What what precisely is an oracle? And I believe you've got, you have some Greek to help us out. I do. I did a little bit of research. This is from uh, S.C. Woodhouse. This is his uh, English Greek lexicon published by the University of Chicago Library in 1910. So oracle, here are some of the words that the Greeks would use to describe the concept of an oracle. There's ta chrysterion, ta manteion. Then there are uh, such expressions as a, a message from heaven, would be a, a logos or perhaps a logia. Um, a fatis is any kind of an oracular expression, a hephatis or a thesphaton. So the, the concept is that the gods are speaking to mortals. Mm-hmm. It's not something that they have to do. It's not something that you can compel them to do. Although if you line up all of your sacrifices properly, you're more likely to get a good response. Indeed. But the the common Greek verb chraomai, one that every student learns in a Greek class, means to use, to enjoy, or famously to consult an oracle. Hmm. And I remember when I was learning Greek low these many years ago, I, I should say beginning to learn Greek, this verb stuck out to me, you know, quite conspicuously. Yeah. To use something, to enjoy something, I understand that. But that the Greeks had a specific word for the consultation of an oracle. It is really striking. Yes, it is. Yeah. Uh, you apparently had the same experience. It did. I, mem- I remember that being on my, you know, my earliest vocabulary Your flashcards, list. Right. right? And it was a. It made it very easy to remember because of that. That you know, so-called third definition was Correct. so specific. Exactly. Yeah. So Greek verbs have this amazing specificity, and I thought, well, this must be important in their culture. They have an entire verb devoted to the idea. Of consulting an oracle. Correct. They don't just cobble them together. Right. Now, you find oracles, I mean, this is not specifically a Greek thing. Um, I mean, there are traditions around the world that that there are certain places and certain priests and priestesses uh, through whom, uh, where you can consult the, the, the gods. That's a very common idea around the world. Uh, but we're going to dealing. We're going to talk about kind of oracles in uh, broadly in the in the Greek world, uh, in the Mediterranean world, and there were a number of them. 
uh, but none as important as Delphi. So there were uh, figures we call sibyls, kind of the these priestesses who were, for lack of a better term, mediums, right, through whom the gods would would you know, shriek and sing. We find one at Erythrae in Asia Minor, okay, uh, which so was quite a ways east, quite a ways east, but then in antiquity that was part of the Greek larger Greek world, okay. right? Uh, the sibyl at Cumae. Yeah, the it, famous one. In right? Italy, yes, right? Famous because of uh, Virgil, right? right? The, the character Aeneas visits there on his travels. Yes. Finds out about Rome's future. We, and we got to do an episode on that. that of course. That extraordinary um, kind of a keyhole tunnel that you go into. In yes. It's, it's amazing. Yeah. Have you visited there? I have. So that's a site where I haven't been. Oh, you haven't? But I thought the story, we were there together. No, no. Okay. No, that was some other co-host. Okay. <laughs> uh, but the, the story of the establishment of the Cumaean Sibyl and Apollo's involvement in that failed romance is really interesting. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. But for another time. Right. There is a the oracle of the of the uh, hero Trophonius in Boeotia. Right. Uh, a place I'm dying to go, a cave where you descend as a, your own catabas is to consult the dead. But you've been through Boeotia, though, right? I have, but I've never stopped at this particular you know, site. Driven past the, the ruins of Thebes. Yes, it, it, right. Exactly. It's now just a big solar farm, basically. Is it now? Yes. I, I was always unimpressed with Thebes. I was too. Well, that's because the thing was razed several times that's true. with only Pindar's house being spared. That's true. That's right. right. But we also have some in the far west. Far west, right? uh, the Oracle of Menestheus in Spain. Mm-hmm. And now getting uh, back to the Greek mainland, uh, Dodona. Dodona, where you and I did visit together yes. in th- 2011. Yes, and this was not an Oracle of Apollo, but that of Zeus. Yeah, I like that site uh, a lot. Me too. It's one of my favorite places. We have to, to cover go. that at some point because it's it seems now I know that the the buildings contemporary with the oracular site have all, you know, disappeared, but it seems like it's stuck out in the middle of nowhere. Right. In Epirus with the a very dramatic mountainous backdrop. Right. And it's that's overwhelming. What, that's one of the reasons I really like it. I think you know, it's off the tourist trail. Right. And the times that I've I've been there there, we've been the only people on site. Correct. It was also the place, do you remember this? We were with students kind of towards the end of the trip, and we were walking beto- uh, behind some young ladies on the trip, and one turned to the other and said, if I see another pile of rocks, I'm no, going to puke. No, no, that wasn't Dodona. It was Dodona. It was Eleusis. It was Eleusis? Yes. Even We even put it on an earlier episode. Did we really? Yeah. Oh, man, I had the wrong spot. Are you there sure was, about There was a lot of rock puking. I'm sure it was Eleusis. <laughs> okay, all right. Sure. Yeah. all right. All right, all right. I was going to say, this is the spot where uh, we talked to our tour guide, right? We were both expecting our, um, well, not us, but our wives, right? children at the time. Mm, oh, that's right. And we revealed that to our, our uh, charming tour guide, and she said, Opa! Opa! We did get we did get the Opa. Yeah, she was really thrilled, because yeah. uh, Greeks tend to have smaller families, and uh, they thought this was, she thought this was great. That's right, I'd forgotten about that. So Dodona's yeah. famous for its oak tree, right. right? And the landscape there still features some of these oak trees. Maybe they're just for tourists, but it's a really gorgeous spot. It is a really good, gorgeous spot, right. Dodona. And then, of course, Delphi. Yes, the subject of today's episode. Right. I mean, there's other thing, other oracles out there, uh, other kind of smaller oracles of the dead. Um, sometime, someday we're going to talk also about the Necromantion, mm-hmm. which was a, a, an oracle in its own particular right. The spot uh, where uh, Odysseus may have entered the underworld. Right. As the saying goes. Exactly right. Um, so this is many of these types of places around the Greek landscape, but none as important and as influential as Delphi. Mm-hmm. Now, um, you know, wh- why did the Greeks kind of place their oracles where they did? I think a lot of it had to do with kind of that wild, natural beauty. Right. You encounter... You encounter the uncanny well outside of the city, mm-hmm. right? And so you, it's in deep, wild nature where you're going to be more in touch with the divine. Absolutely. Right. So, I, I mean, so I, divinity I, litters the landscape, if I can interrupt. Yeah, please do. Divinity litters the landscape, you might say. But uh, when I've lectured on, say, the, the palace of um, Minos at Knossos mm-hmm. on Crete, the inverted columns, right? They look like trees. Yes. And so I make the point, which it sounds fanciful, but the research that I've read supports this idea that part of the the goal of uh, Greco-Roman architecture is to bring the outdoors inside. Yeah. And the column was originally a type of homage to the tree. Without a doubt. Because you come into a sacred gl- uh, glen or glade, right? And the trees bring the sunlight dappled down through the canopy and falls on this landscape. And you have this impression... I'm in a numinous place. Yes. Oh, without doubt. I, I buy that completely. You do. Right? And this idea that kind of like the building of even a temple like the Parthenon, the idea is kind of behind that is you, you can never outdo the beauty of nature. Right. The best you can do is kind of extend it. Well, yeah. Right? Im- imitate it. Imitate it. And then extend it by making it stone, you're yeah. saying. Yes. Right. Yeah. 
Uh, so I think that's that's kind of that power of the numinous place mm-hmm. is all has its fingerprints all over kind of the locations of these oracles. Right. right. Now I often describe when I talk to people about my travels, I often describe Delphi as the most beautiful place I've ever been. I say the same thing. Do you really? I do. Now I haven't I haven't been you know that many places in the world. Yeah, me my, me either. Yeah. Uh, I've been to you know I've never been to South America. I've been to um, uh, Korea, but not not China or many places east. But in all of uh, Greece, Italy, all of Europe, any place I've been there, sh- certainly the U.S., yeah, Delphi is it. Right. It's uh, it's so extraordinary. It's so dramatic. Um, you know, h- halfway up the slopes of Mount Parnassus, everywhere you turn, there's an incredible vista. So the site of uh, of Delphi, so extraordinary, extraordinary beauty, and it's very clear from um, the stories that the Greeks told that it was sacred to them. Uh, for many, many reasons, mm-hmm. not just because of, of its site as an oracle, but they attach many legends to, to Parnassus that um, set it apart. Yeah, so Parnassus is the mountain which, on whose slopes the, uh, the site of the oracle is, yes, the, the south, shrine. The south side of, the, of mm-hmm. the slopes of Parnassus, yes. Overlooking the Gulf of Corinth. Yeah. And you look down, this was, as you were saying, the natural beauty. I was there for the first time in 2011. You were there earlier. Mm-hmm. But um, you look down from the site and uh, you look down into the sea of olive groves yes. down below. More than a million black and silver leafed, uh, leaved olive trees in the valley below. It's yeah. just breathtaking. Incredible. And then this, in the sparkling sea in the distance. Correct. Right? Yeah, it's, it's, it's unbelievable. And you can see to the other side of the Gulf of Corinth and you can see the Peloponnesus. Right. Yeah. On a clear day, it's the, the the view just goes on and on and on. It's incredible. Yeah, with little bits of smoke rising from the valley as the farmers are clipping uh, the the olive trees, pruning them right, and then collecting all of the branches together and burning them. Yeah. So yeah, it's 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 incredible. Um, so the Greeks told many stories about Delphi, um, and one of their legends uh, suggests that they th- they thought of Parnassus as the center of the world, mm-hmm. or, or as they as they called it, the omphalos. Yeah, the, the, the navel, the belly button. Our listeners may not know, I find students often don't, that the world actually has a belly button. Yes, right. It's at Delphi. So the story goes that Zeus, wanting to determine where this was, set forth uh, two of his sacred eagles, eagles, one from the far east and one from the far west. They flew towards each other and where they met. Did they collide they, or did they cross? I think they, they high-fived okay. as, as they went past each other. And that was right above Parnassus. Huh. And so uh, you can still see this at Delphi today. They, they, they mark the omphalus with a kind of an acorn-shaped stone. Yes. Right. It's so, an Audi. It's you an you Audi. may not know. The, you do because you've been there. But <laughs> the world's belly button is an Audi. It's true. It's true. Um, and, and by analogy, right, the famous Vitruvius man that uh, mm-hmm. Leonardo da Vinci drew, right, based on Vitruvius, the Roman architect, You've got a, a man's body, right? Unclothed man's body circumscribed within a circle. Yep. Or I, I guess you have, can only be circumscribed within a circle. And uh, the center point is the omphalos, the navel. The navel, the belly mm-hmm. button, right. Um, so this marks it as um, an extraordinarily important place. Right, right? the so center of the universe. The center of the universe is going to have some kind of you know, s- a spiritual charge to it. Right. right. So the omphalos is there, a stone that supposedly fell from heaven, yeah. but it's carved with pomegranates and all kinds of elaborate floral designs and right. such. I believe that they have that one in the museum. They Correct. Can, and uh, on site, they have kind of your generic omphalos you get on the low shelf. What, do they buy them by the dozen or something? It's like, it's like next to the you know the generic bagged cereal. Right. right you can pick up your, your bland, your <laughs> blank omphalos. I think you mentioned Funyuns last time. <laughs> Did I? <laughs> the aftertaste has been, of that comment has been with me all week. <laughs> oh, sorry about that. That's okay. Yeah. So uh, at some point, the tradition developed that Apollo becomes associated with this Correct. place. Correct. Right. And so one version of the story goes is that, you know, he's a young god. Apollo is one of the deities that's usually depicted as beardless. He's mm-hmm. kind of eternally young. Driving a motorcycle. Exactly. Kind of rebelling a little bit. Wind flipping through the hair. Very James Deany. Right. Yep. Not sure he wants to accept Zeus's, you know, control. Right. And so he's wandering around kind of looking to kind of, you know, establish his own... Yeah, make a name for his himself. Own, he wants to do his own thing. Right. And he finds himself on the slopes of Parnassus where he finds the site guarded or inhabited by this giant snake. A giant snake. Right. The right. pytho. With, yeah, with it. its serpentine coils. So pytho or pytho mm-hmm. apparently is the Greek verb to rot. Yes. You're getting to that. No, go, take it away because that, that is where I was going, but tell Okay. Yeah. All right. So um, as a kindness to the locals, because Apollo, you know, is a, a god of culture, right? He's a... He's a god of civilization. What's the word I'm looking for? Cult hero? Um, certain expression I'm trying to grasp. Here. I mean, god of civilization, I think, says it. All right. Yeah. Well, we'll go with that then. So he thinks, well, I can uh, off this giant serpent, and then the locals will have more ease and convenience in making a living. So he takes his bow and arrow, his silver bow, and his, his quiver with caps on both ends, and he 
uh, kills the snake. Yes. And then he buries it underground. Well, a giant serpent like that is going to stink as it rots, and that's what it does, right? So pitho means to rot, and that serpent then, uh, you know, decomposed entirely. The catch is that he didn't know this snake was um, sacred to Gaia, to Mother Earth. Right, right, right. So I mean, one of the, the theories about this story is that um, in slaying the, the snake, we're seeing kind of a, uh, a kind of a male-based cult kind of supplanting what was an earlier kind of mm. earth-based cult. Yeah. Right? It's called Myth of the Matriarchy, right? Yes. Yeah. And so... Uh, a we, mostly discredited theory, I think. Yeah. But that's Max Muller, isn't it? It is, yeah. The, the patriarchy versus matriarchy origins right. of Greek and Roman myth. Most scholars don't think much of the theory any, a, anymore, but it's. It, I think it's an, at least it's an interesting idea Absolutely. when looking at a story like this. Absolutely. Yeah. So he, uh, so Apollo takes the takes the the um, the governance of the site, and um, he has to do some penance. Oh, it remind me of that. Yeah. Well, I mean, Guy is very angry, so he has to go through a time of purification and so forth to atone for killing the pitho. Which, although you'd right. want to do it to help the people, you're not supposed to do it because the uh, the snake is sacred to Gaia. Right. There's lots of stories uh, in Greek mythology like that. Um, and and uh, Apollo, I mean, he, he he does that again where he has to, what well, we talked about like the play uh, Alcestis, right? That's right. He's also kind of doing penance uh, once again right. for uh, his hot temper. Yeah. Wasn't that Hercules? No, it's uh, it's Apollo. Oh, my mistake. Yes, yeah, right. It's Apollo who then gives uh, Admetus the gift of my mistake. escaping death. Right. Okay. Yep. So then in, um, in gratitude, I guess, in kindness to the locals, uh, there at Delphi, he establishes the oracle. That's right. So after the establishment of the site, uh, and there are actually Mycenaean r- ruins there mm-hmm. at the site, so it goes way, way back to, say, 2300 to 1800 BC, uh, there were games that were held there. Right. right. In historical time, uh, it, one of the four Panhellenic games, so these were called in honor of Apollo, the Pythian games. Right. Right. Then also you've got the Olympic, everyone knows those, and then the other two, the Nemean and Isthmian. But the archaeological site, right, we climb up the side of the mountain, and, and you remember, I can see it, right, clearly in the mind's eye. The stadium is at the very top of the slope. Yeah. So if, it's if, really dramatic. If you're going to compete, right, in, say, the 100-yard you know, dash, the, the, you know, the stadion, first you've got to lumber up to the top of the mountain. Yeah, exactly. You're going to be completely wiped out for any kind of race, right? Yeah, and I, plus, the air's thinner up there. Exactly. It's a tough, it's a tough place to, to do cardio. Absolutely. But the, uh, <laughs> not a lot of insanity going to be going on up no, there. No, 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 no. But the Greeks, unlike the Romans, they never seem to have uh, landscaped or terraformed very much, right? The Romans tear stuff down and put beautiful objects and buildings where it's convenient. Right. The Greeks always just stuff things into the landscape wherever it's most beautiful. Right. And I prefer, the, actually, the Greek aesthetic. Well, I uh, do too, but I could never compete in those games. Oh, man. No way. It was hard enough just walking up there, <laughs> right? Wiped out after 10 meters. Yeah. But it's great. You, if you walk past the whole site, the temple, the oracle, the theater, you keep going up kind of through the forest, all of a sudden, right. boom, there's this full-scale stadium. There. Yes. It's, it's incredibly impressive. It is, which the Romans, you know, adapted a little bit. They put seating in there. Right. But you remember the, the phenomenon, right, or the experience. You get to the site and you think, oh, this is a grand view. I couldn't see anything better than this. You go up 50 yards up the slope and now you think, oh, well, this is the best this view. Is the best and that view. just keeps happening the further up you go. It is. It's breathtaking. You don't think it could get any better. Yep. So the earliest temple is dated to when? About the ninth century. Okay. I mean, you go back that far, it's, it's, it's a lot of guesswork, but mm-hmm. we think that it was a, a working, functioning oracle somewhere at least by the ninth century. And that's, that's, we're still kind of in those Greek dark ages right. at, this, at this point. And uh, this is the temple to Apollo, of course. Right. right. Yeah, and temple so to Apollo, yeah. The earliest, uh, the remaining temple, though, is seventh century, right? We, um, we have some ruins there of the... Uh, the, the temple that, that you see today is, is from the fourth century. Uh, my mistake. But it's built on the remains of a seventh century right. temple. So there are, you know, there's layers to this thing. Yeah. Right. And this is a Doric temple. Yes. Right. Right. So there's a few columns that are, have been you know, reset, right. reset up there. Uh, I mean, we know on the 4th century temple, it had, it had these famous maxims over the, the doors on either side, or uh, genotis auton. Yeah, you know, know thyself. And made in a gun, nothing too much. Nothing too much. Right. That, with uh, Plato and Aristotle, respectively, made a lot of this. That's right? right. So we'll get to that later. But Plato with the genotis auton, know thyself, and the Aristotelian golden mean, don't overdo it. Right. Made in a gun. It's, uh, it's, it's the, like the slogans of, De- uh, the mottos, if you will, of Delphi. Absolutely. Yep. And so the the lifespan of the oracle, just to fast forward, how long did it stay in operation? It it was a working oracle until um, 
the the fifth century AD. Yep. Where it was uh, like many of these other Panhellenic sites uh, were was shut down by uh, one or another Christian emperor. Justinian, I think, is the individual. Is he the one who shut this one it down? Closed them down. Yep. Exactly. As as uh, you know, uh, no longer proper. Well, they are pagan sites and correct you know, need to be need to be closed. You shouldn't be doing that. Yep. So then, then finally abandoned what in the sixth or seventh century AD. Yep. And then left to kind of to to rot as okay. it were. And uh, be covered up and not uh, discovered again until the 19th century. Right. Yeah. So we're dealing mainly today with the process of consulting the oracle, mm-hmm. right? So the kinds of questions you might put to the oracle, the kinds of answers you're going to get. And uh, we've, we've covered in just brief detail a little bit of the site, what it looks like. Uh, maybe one more element we should touch on before we go to the break. And what's that? Well, that is um, the treasuries that were there. Oh, right, right. We yeah. should talk about that a little bit. Two in particular, the most famous, the Athenian treasury and uh, then the Siphnian treasury. Mm-hmm. So could you describe for the listeners a little bit, Jeff, what what are treasuries doing there in the first place? So when um, at its height, when a, uh, someone looking to consult the oracle would approach the temple, they'd walk up these, uh, these kind of turning switchbacks, which would get you to the temple mount. And at every step, you're encountering all these porticos and these what look like kind of mini temples along the way, which we call treasuries. And these were established by various city-states in which they would load it up with treasure and gift offerings to the oracle for thanks uh, for the advice and, and, um, and answers that the oracle gave. And one of the most popular, right, to dedicate was a bronze tripod. Tripod, right, which the, the priestess through whom the god spoke is said to have sat Right, so it becomes, on one of these, on one of these, the the tripod becomes the, therefore kind of a symbol of Delphi. Right, so it's a three legged uh, tripod, obviously, mm-hmm. a bronze work of art, cast bronze, on the top of which there's a large cauldron. Yes, and uh, around the rim of those there were these uh, griffins and other frightening heads, and. Uh, after you consulted the oracle, you'd make a dedication, mm-hmm. right, in gratitude to Apollo, and these would be stuffed into the treasury. Right. And then the treasuries themselves, like you were saying, these mini temples had a very elaborate and beautiful artwork on them, much of which is now in the museum right next to right. the site. And um, But if I'm remembering correctly, this was kind of used a little bit like an ancient ATM in some ways. Certainly, right. So I've heard Delphi described as, as the bank of the ancient world. Right. An incredibly wealthy place because it was just stuffed with bronze, silver, and gold. Yes, but uh, maybe instead of a bank, it's more like a convenience store. Oh. Because right? it was always getting knocked off. <laughs> That's true. That's right. right. I think Philip went through there, Philip II. Uh, a lot of... Um, what, uh, warlords and imperialists mm. would stop off at Delphi and rob the place blind. That's right. Uh, in order to pay their soldiers and such. Yeah, top off the coffers That's Correct. While, while we're here, right. Yeah. And I think they often would leave a bit of an IOU, you know, after I, after I uh, conquer my enemies, if I take back Persia. Don't worry, I'll rebuild everything, but I really need these funds now. Now, yeah. yeah and yeah. Um, so that was, uh, that was surprising to me because why would they place so much trust in the, in the site as a safeguard? It was just based on respect right. that other city-states wouldn't dare to loot the place because it was a holy place. I guess so. I mean, it's a difficult place to get to. I mean, even now. Yes. Uh, um, so, I mean, if you're plundering it, it's, a, it's work. You've got to climb a big mountain to, to mm-hmm. get it. So, I mean, there are some kind of natural defenses, but at the same time, you're right. It's it's kind of there for the taking. Yeah. Maybe it's a little bit like Nicolas Cage in uh, Raising Arizona. Have oh, you seen that one? one of my favorites. I like that one, too. Yeah. Finally, a movie we both like. <laughs> I love the Coen brothers. Yeah. So, he's got to rob uh, the... the the convenience store, right, for diapers. Right. And he's a very poor criminal and, and does it with a lot of uh, sense of um, regret. Right? Yes. But he needs it. So I, I think this is how the, the warlords would have acted. and would have, would have seen it, yeah. Yeah, in robbing Delphi. Right. All right, so we're going to get around to what it took, what it looked like, what it sounded like, what it felt like to actually consult the oracle, but we're going to do that after the break. This episode of Ad Nauseam is brought to you by Racial Coffee of Portland, Oregon. Mark Helwig and his crack team have solved all of your coffee-based problems. Jeff, what do you like about the Racial 6? Uh, that's the machine that I have on my countertop. Um, I love everything about the 6. I love the way it looks. It's sleek. It's beautiful. Minimalist, kind of. Minimalist, right. right. I, I like to get, to get the coffee, the whole thing kind of set up the night before. So in the morning, I stumble downstairs. I hit the button. It goes through the bloom stage, gets rid of all that nasty CO2, enters the brew stage. You can see the the the, uh, the water bubbling and right. you can hear it steaming through the Fibonacci head, down through the cone, into the carafe, where just a few minutes later, 
I have the um, the perfect coffee waiting for me. You're drinking some great coffee. It's true. Now, is this just kind of a solo enterprise for you, Dr. Winkle? No, 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 no. My my wife loves it. My wife is actually a, a much bigger uh, kind of coffee aficionado than I am. She loves it. Um, she she's saying it's I don't think you should say your wife is much bigger. I think you should say she's more dedicated to coffee. I said she's a bigger aficionado. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, sorry. My mistake. Okay, sorry. That, she loves coffee more than I do. <laughs> And so she loves it. She's loved it from day one. My, 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 my boys are fascinated with it as kind of a machine. It's kind of a science experiment. It is. It's, it's great stuff. And you have the ratio eight. I have the eight. Which yes, you love. I do. It's uh, an oyster. You can choose different colors. It's got walnut accents. There's not a, a piece of cheap material in the entire thing. In fact, there is no plastic in it whatsoever, except a tiny little bit at the nozzle where the water comes out. That's it. I have that on Mark's authority. Right. And now, speaking of the ratio eight... Um, what's the big news about uh, well, for our listeners? Yeah, the big news, which uh, we're going to keep announcing in, uh, next week also, is that you can now get the Ratio 8 for 15% off, not just the 6. Which has been the offer uh, up to this point. Correct, because yep. that's been in stock. But now the 8 is in stock also, and you can use the same coupon, which is? It is A-N-C-O. Yes. You go to RatioCoffee.com. Um, find the machine you want, the six or the eight. Put it in your grocery basket. And uh, hit click, send, buy, submit. You're going to have it. And you will not regret this. No, you will not. This coffee machine will last a long time. You might even leave it to your descendants. This episode of Ad Nauseam also brought to you by The Moss Method. Uh, Dave, tell us about The Moss Method for Greek. Thank you. Well, The Moss Method is a program I have developed that teaches you all of the grammar, all of the syntax, all of the semantics, everything you need to know the Greek language, but it does so in a way that I think is both enjoyable and uh, not tedious. Excellent. And I, you can go, I, I believe the phrase is you can go from neophyte to erudite in a fairly short time in this That's right. in a self-paced tutorial. That's right. I have divided Moss's reader, this is a, a Greek reader from the 19th century, into four different modules. And I, I take you from the very beginning. You don't know the alphabet? That's fine. I've got audio recordings to teach you the alphabet. You do know the alphabet. But good. Then I teach you how to syllabify, how to break up the words into syllables, right? Even a big Greek word can be pronounced uh, accurately if you just break it down into the syllables. Then I teach you verbs and nouns and pronouns and all that kind of stuff. But we never lose sight of the fact that it's a language and it's supposed to be enjoyable. Excellent. Now tell us about this office hours feature too. Right. Well, the office hours is the opportunity for my Moss students to connect with me directly. So it's self-paced, right? They move through the course at their own rate, but I don't leave them just there to struggle on their own. I meet with them each week. You, talk, you mean live? Yes, on Zoom. There's no f no flacky who does this. Oh, no, it's you. No lunky. I do it myself. Yeah, no lunkies involved. That's right. You get an exclusive Zoom invitation to the Moss Method office hours, and you come into the room, and you just talk about anything you want. Yeah. I explain Greek. We talk history, literature, theology, philosophy, whatever you want. So it doesn't have to be about the Greek. You, you, well, you can... About anything in the, uh, about the classical world, but uh, you keep it grounded in the Greek. I steer it back to Greek. Gotcha. It's about the Greek. That's your job. Exactly. Right. Oh, that sounds great. So if you're trying to learn New Testament, if you, quote, learned New Testament in seminary, but you feel like you're getting a little rusty, you want to scrape the barnacles off, this is the course for you. So how do you go about doing this? You go to mossmethod.com. You watch the introductory video. Uh, you read how the course is described and laid out. And then you, you purchase it, and we get going on this. Sounds great. Check yep. it out. $299 value. I don't think you're going to regret it. This episode is also brought to you by Hackett Publishing. Jeff, I'm at Hackett's website right now. Yeah, what are you looking at? I'm looking at the things they have, the, the volumes they have on offer for devotees of the classics. Yeah. And I see First Order Logic, A Concise Introduction, Second Edition by John Heil. I see uh, Les Français, Fourth Edition. Join authors Julia Fett, uh, Julie Fett and Jean-François Bruyère for their Les Français, Fourth Edition online book launch event. Wow, so you're saying that Hackett doesn't just carry classical titles. Oh, no. They have everything. I'm looking at the catalog here. they got Asian studies, classical studies, of course, lingua latina per se illustrata, which I love, mm -hmm. history, Latin American studies, you name it, philosophy, political theory, religion, theater, and film. I want to ask, what don't they have? Yeah, no, that's great. I've, I've, I love Hackett. I've used their stuff for years in, at home and in the classroom. Now, you're going to mention those covers, aren't you? I, I, I was going to refrain because I, 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 I effuse about them all the time. You but do. I do love the, the clever covers. Great work of art, affordable, what's not to like. Exactly. So what can the listener do if they want to support this podcast and at the same time, two for one, get for themselves some excellent uh, works of literature. Well, they should go to hackettpublishing.com, H-A-C-K-E-T-T, publishing.com. Uh, search their catalog, their vast catalog, find what you want. Um, and then in the coupon code, when you're ready to check out, you put in AN2021, 
Wait a minute. They yeah. got to put something in a grocery basket first, don't they? Oh, we need to go there? Next to the dozen eggs and the side of bacon? Exactly right. They, they just tuck it right in there. Right okay. In there. Yep. They and t- the thin wheats. <laughs> the Funyuns. The Funyuns. <laughs> you tap A-N-2021 and you will get two things. You will get 20% off your entire order and free shipping. That's incredible. It's 20% off? It's a huge deal. And free shipping. Yep. So what, what would you suggest they do? I suggest they check it out. Check it out. Okay, Jeff, so as we get back into it, mm-hmm. can you explain to us a little bit about who consulted the Oracle? For whom for whom was this designed, you might say? Right. It's I mean, there's difficulties and we'll we'll get into these as we as we go along is that um there's still lots of mystery about uh, you know, what kinds of questions were asked and, and who asked the questions. I mean, a lot of the, the stuff about the Oracle shows up in myths and in history, which um, is difficult to kind of discern, well, did this really happen or is it part of a tradition? But it, what it seems to be is the Oracle was designed for uh, questions uh, asked both by, say, like ambassadors of, of state, right. so totally east, so city-states would send um, their lunkies to the Oracle to ask mm-hmm. questions on behalf of the city-state. Yeah, Croesus and, and Herodotus, right? Right, yeah. Famously sent an ambassador to Delphi to ask if I, what was it? Is it if I invade Asia? Or, yeah, know, or should I should I attack the Persians? Should I attack the Persians? Right, and the, the famous Oracle came back, paraphrased, if you attack the Persians, you will... Destroy a great empire. Right, and that, that famous ambiguity. So Croesus right. says, green light. Right. You know, I've got it, right? But of course the empire destroys is his own. Right. Right. So yeah, so um, lots of stories like that. So not just the polis and their ambassadors, but also individuals. Individuals, right? And uh, it's my sense is that in the kind of the long, you know, hundred thousands of years history of the Oracle of Delphi, probably most of the questions asked were that by individuals. Yes. And and the vast majority of those simply do not survive. Right. So there's lots of guesswork here. And we'll try there, to fill in the gaps. There's the, that concept of miasma, right? Right. So also in um, in, in myth, this this comes up is that uh, this idea that Apollo is the one Olympian deity who can rid you of the kind of the pollution that you might carry, the spiritual pollution of miasma if, if you're guilty of murder. Yes, moral guilt. Moral guilt, right? Primarily so, murder, but it would also be incest, right? Any anything that's very serious. Anything kind of crossing those kind of those big taboos: incest, cannibalism, murder. Right. So Heracles goes there. He, in his madness, he kills his wife and children, and so Apollo assigns him the penance of the labors. Right. Um, Orestes, after killing his mother to avenge his father, Clytemnestra, uh, who, who killed Agamemnon. Right. He, he goes to Apollo to rid himself of the Furies and and this like. So it's. I tend to think that. Yes, these are famous mythic stories, but if it was not reflective of a reality, um, I don't know if those stories would survive. So I mean, the question, to what degree did, did those kinds of stories reflect what people were actually looking for? Correct. Yeah. I think they're highly reflective. Yeah, I, I do too. I tend to be a true believer about these things. Yes, I do too. The first time I wrote, as a side note, the first time I wrote Miasma uh, on the board in a mythology class, yeah. I was talking on about on and on about Miasma. Right? <laughs> My asthma is a moral pollution. It affects us all. And then finally I wrote it on the board and one of the students raised his hand and said, uh, Professor Noe, I thought you were, you know, struggling with some kind of a respiratory condition. You're, you're, I thought you had asthma. You're as- asthmatic, right? No, <laughs> no. it's my asthma. Uh, <laughs> oh, come on, get out of here. Exactly. Right, right, right. So how did you approach the Oracle? Again, there's lots of gaps in our knowledge, but it wasn't a it wasn't like a 7-Eleven. It wasn't a open 24-7. You just show up and get yourself an Oracle. It was only open on certain auspicious days. And um, there were attendant you know, sacrifices that would determine whether this was a good day to, for, to open the Oracle. Mm-hmm. So you had to kind of plan your plan your trip. I, I would love to know some of the, this. How did people... To, you know, to go to Delphi, you really have to want to go to Delphi. Yeah, well, there was an app you could check. Oh, an ancient app, right. Yep. Yeah, yeah. Was it just something called, like, uh, Oracle? Yeah, or? no, I think it was called Pitho. Pitho, nice. It's a pretty good app name, so, isn't it? So you could check You could check when it was open. Right. Two snakes, you're good to go. <laughs> no snakes, you better stay home. Better stay home, right. Mm-hmm. Okay, well, that answers that question. Right. But I would like to, you know, to know that, uh, you know, how did people plan their trips? You know, how far did they travel? You know, were they waiting in line? All the stuff that we just simply it was a, don't. It was a pilgrimage site. Right. It was a, were there pith stops along? Oh, oh my this, goodness. Sorry. Usually I'm the one with the insufferable puns. I know. You're rubbing, you're rubbing off pith on Pith stops. Right. So if you, if we take the archaeological site as a guide of what it was like. Okay. You approach the site from the bottom. Correct. There's a road leads there. Makes sense. Yeah, exactly. Um, you don't kind of come down from the top. You don't come over to the other side of the no, mountain, right? No, it's too sheer. Yep. 
And you pass the temple of Athena. Yeah, the Athena Pronaya. Pronaya, the Athena, the Athena before you get to the shrine. I love these descriptive names. Isn't that nice? Yeah, Athena Pronaya, the one before the shrine. Yeah, it's what's interesting about it's a beautiful little temple. It's, it's a, gorgeous. It's a circular kind of rare Tholo style yeah. um, building, and it, it often kind of makes its way into postcards. In some ways, it's it's much more picturesque than the Temple of Apollo itself. Well, I think that's because of its location. When the sun strikes it, oh. the first time I saw it again, 2011. The, the sun strikes it as dusk. Those uh, columns, you know, they become a kind of a golden luminescent color. Yeah. And it's really It beautiful. is. And you kind of hear in your head the, oh, you know, the the, uh, the the dramatic music behind it. But what's interesting, I was just doing some some um, some research for this episode and just clicking around on the interwebs. What you often find is that picture of uh, Pronaya and people will um, label it. The Oracle of Delphi. Oh, it's mislabeling. It's, it's, it's mislabeling. Yes. So it was. On, it was that picture. That does that was on, bother you? It does bother me. I can tell. So because I had the same problem when I, the first time I went to Greece as an undergraduate, um, as a gift I got the blue guide, the famous you know archaeological yes. guide, and the picture on the front was that uh, Athena Pronaya temple. Right. And I knew it was at Delphi, and I assumed, oh, that must that was be, it. That was the Oracle. So it's a question. It's a problem. It's a mistake people are still making. Right. So you would approach the temple from the lower part. And from, the, from the east to southeast, probably. Yes, exactly. And like many of these Panhellenic sites, you would do your due diligence to other gods. It wasn't mm-hmm. just Apollo. You'd, you know, so you'd, One-stop shopping. Yep. You kind of, you, uh, um, you offer a sacrifice, maybe some, some money, a, a prayer, a votive to Athena, other gods along the way before the main event. Then you'd make your way up the hill and the Castalian Springs which still run down the mountain, mm-hmm. uh, a natural spring on Parnassus thought to be holy purifying waters. Mm-hmm. Uh, you would purify yourself, um, as would the priests and prophets of the, of the temple would purify yourself in the Castalian Spring uh, to cleanse yourself so you were, you were ready to um, enter to the site proper. Right. Yep. Then you make your way up the switchbacks that we were talking about. You walk past all the treasuries. And the statues and the tripods. It must have been overwhelming in its heyday. You know, mm-hmm. you know today the, you know, there, there's that Athenian treasury, which has been heavily reconstructed. In Correct. In sense. Um, but in its heyday, it must have just, if the sun was shining, it must have mm-hmm. been blinding. Yes. You know, glittering all of all of those tripods. and The, the gold, the bronze, the silver, the, the gleaming buildings. Yes. Multicolored, by the way. Right. And uh, there was a little spot there where each of the Roman uh, emperors had a, um, uh, you know, a, a, f- a bust or a statue. Right. You know the spot I'm talking mm-hmm, about? I do. And you'd file past that on your way up because the Romans took over all these sites and reconstructed, expanded, decorated, some would say, what, um, defiled them, I suppose. <laughs> but, it, uh, I mean, as opposed to other places where the Romans would, you know, raise things to the ground. Correct. They were, by and large, deep lovers of, of all things Hellenic and, and kept these things going, mm-hmm. right? So once you got up to the Temple Mount and you, you're waiting your, your place in line, uh, you'd have to offer some kind of sacrifice. Mm-hmm. It was not free to consult the oracle. Yeah, so this is past the polygonal wall. Yes. And someday we'll do an episode on the inscriptions on the polygonal wall. An episode just on those inscriptions? Well, I think so, because there, there are so many of them. Hundreds of them. They're fascinating. Yeah. So the polygonal wall is a rocks that have been coped to fit together. So these are not, you know, um, rectilinear. These are not square. These are rocks that are you know, shaped together in ways you would never think possible. It's really striking and interesting. Yes. Uh, something was showing off. I Absolutely. Think. Yeah. <laughs> You so, go past that, you come up to the Temple Mount. Yep, and so uh, you'd make a, you'd make a sacrifice. The the priests before the the the, or, the day of the oracle, they would make sacrifices to kind of open the whole event. Uh, you'd have to bring some sort of, of sacrifice again. Who knows how consistent it was over the centuries? Um, other things I've read, you were you bring a if you couldn't afford a full sacrificial animal, you could bring a sacred cake. You know, it's like a honey bun or a leftovers kind of little Debbie snack right. cake for uh, for the priests, and that would get you uh, get you entry. And so, um, if the sacrifices went well, if they did, if the um, you know if the animal didn't shake the water off its head, right. things like this, um, then then it was a go. Um, so again, we don't we don't exactly know. They, they didn't keep records on on uh, you know numbers, how many people uh, visited the oracle, or um, you know how much was spent in, to do so. There are inscriptions there that suggest that Poli East um, may needed to kind of purchase the right to right. the oracle. There's a there's a large inscription there on a, the base of what was a statue or a tripod there that reads in Greek, uh, Delphoi edokon hios pro monte ein, mm-hmm. which is something along the like Delphi granted to the Kians, the people of the island of Chios, the pro monte ein, the right to consult the oracle. Yeah, I think it's the right to consult first. 
Oh, is that? Oh, is it's, they, it's first consultation. So, so they're 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 cutting in line. Skip the queue. Okay. Exactly. Right. Which must have been because the Keans had to have done the residents of Delphi some keen favor. Right. And so they got to skip the queue. Right. So that could yeah m- could not have been cheap. No. To, to oh this. no no no. Right. So yeah. Uh, and so yeah, doing these kinds of things you know, gave you the right to if you spent enough money, you could raise up a a, a statue to commemorate your visit there. Right. Right. So, and, and these yep. things came from a great distance. Chios is interesting, one of these islands, right? But uh, there's Naxos, you know, the Naxians made dedications there. So this was really a pan-Hellenic site. They came from all over the place, as well as the east, as we've said. But this was not limited to a small geographical era, no. area. Right, it wasn't just the locals doing this. Being, no, no. People made journeys that must have taken weeks right. uh, to do this. A truly international site. Yep. So if all of that went well uh, and everything was cleared... Then the inquirer would enter the temple. There's some question about you know, how far into the temple you know, were the, the, the uh, questioners allowed inside. Um, some think yes, some think no, but they would meet there with, a, uh, um, with one of the, the prophets or the priests of the temple. And they would ultimately take the question into the, the back room, the, kind of the, the sanctum sanctorum, the, mm-hmm. the, the holy of holies of the temple, where the, the medium set, the so-called Pythia. Yeah, this was a young woman, right? Mm-hmm. We're going to get a description here from Plutarch. Is that right? Yes, and Plutarch was a priest at Delphi himself, so yes. he knows what he's talking about. So, so Plutarch is um, in the Roman era, right? First century AD, mm-hmm. uh, writing in Greek. Yes, and he wrote a lot about Delphi. Yes. And kind of the mysterious things that happened there. And, so, and he was an eyewitness, uh, an insider. So um, he's trustworthy. So uh, he writes about the, the Pythia. Even so, the maiden who now serves the god here was born of as lawful and honorable wedlock as anyone, and her life has been in all respects proper. But having been brought up in the home of poor peasants, she brings nothing with her as the result of technical skill or of any other expertness or faculty. Wait a minute. Yes. She, she couldn't do anything? She couldn't do anything. Because she, she was raised in the home of poor peasants? Uh, I mean, Plutarch's maybe being a little bit of a snob Could she drive a car? I think the idea is she's kind of a blank slate. Okay. Right? She's got to be empty and pure. And this is necessary for the divine influence to come upon her. Yes. Right. As she goes down into the shrine. On the contrary, just as Xenophon believes that a bride should have been seen as little and heard as little as possible before she proceeds to her husband's house, so this girl inexperienced and uninformed about practically everything, <laughs> a pure virgin soul becomes the associate of the god. So kind of hidden away to play this very circumscribed and very deeply holy role for mm. the Greeks. Yeah, A tabula rasa, like you're saying, yes. just a blank slate. Right. So that's from Plutarch's Moralia. I want to give some credit to the translator here. Please this do. is a public domain translation. It is. Uh, Babbitt. Babbitt. Translated that for us. Yep. So she's back there, and this there's kind of one of the one of the big mysteries of what happened back there. Mm-hmm. So uh, by all accounts, she sits in this back room, perching on the top of a tripod, and the, she would receive the question, whatever it was. And in the Greek belief, she was imbued with the god, possessed by Apollo. Right. And she would shriek forth, babble forth, sing forth her answers in a kind of glossolalia and a kind of speaking in tongues. Yeah, and we have. Um Vase paintings, right? Yes. That show her perched on the tripod, sitting there, waiting for the inspiration. Right. The the requirements, again, just to summarize, the yep. requirements for this job, right, was you have to be a young woman who knows absolutely nothing. Nothing. Right. You're kind of born for this role. Okay. And, and then you and could get the job. Then you could get the job. As you sat there, the spirit of Apollo would come upon you. You'd shriek incoherently, mm-hmm. correct? And then how did these, this uh, incoherent shrieking get translated into something that was intelligible for the uh, person making the request, asking the question. Then apparently the, the priest who took you back there was trained in this art and would, would be able to interpret. And then he would respond, in, in the famous examples, he would respond in a few lines of verse to mm-hmm. answer, your, answer your questions. Perfect hexameter. Yes. So this is where I typically uh, introduce a note of skepticism. Oh, please. Okay. All right. Well, I mean, when I'm lecturing on this to students, because I want them to believe that this was all real mm-hmm. in the sense that the persons involved truly, really believed that the, the God was uh, imparting knowledge and wisdom. Yes. And, uh, you know, based on my thoughts of what the place represents, I think that was true. Uh, yet, this part is a little bit hard to accept. What, what do you find hard to accept? Well, the shrieking uh-huh. uh, is immediately translated into perfect and beautiful hexameters. <laughs> yeah, right, 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 yeah. There's got to be a large element of human influence there. Surely. And exactly how that interfaces with the concept of inspiration you know, is, is unclear to me. Right. No, I hear you. I hear you, right? So, I mean, some of this, of course, I think has been exaggerated by these historical accounts, right? 
But I think a lot of scholars think that most of the questions that were actually posed to the Oracle were, were designed to get a yes or no answer. Okay. So, uh, I mean, I think there's probably some embedded historical truth there. I mean, I, I'm also skeptical that, you know, the, the prophet was... You know, had a perfect examiner waiting, I and mean, also, you know, heard that you know the the response of the oracles were kind of like fortune cookies that they they were ambiguous enough that you, you could take them in many ways. So maybe they had like, you know, a pocket full of hexameters. Right. Say, oh, this will work for somebody looking for advice on colonization. Yeah, something yeah. important is going to happen today. Right. Exactly. That's for me. Well, wow, man, so glad I came. Right. Three weeks by boat and donkey. Exactly. <laughs> so glad I bought the kung pao. Right. Exactly. Yes. There's also a question about what happened in that back room. So right. If we, if we, if we reject that she's not being possessed by the god Apollo. So we discount mm-hmm. right the supernatural explanation. Yes. So then we're left with what hallucinogenic drugs. Hallucinogenic dr- drugs or some kind of vent of gases from the earth, mm-hmm. um, which is a really interesting. Those are the two idea. leading ones, aren't they? Right. And there she were, chewed some kind of leaves. And, and when we were there at yeah. Delphi, this is the standard tour guide explanation yes. that uh, Christiana gave us. Right, right. So sometimes it's it's some strain of the laurel tree, which was sacred to Apollo, that if you chew that in enough quantities... Um, what, what were those quantities? Like a bushel or... Was it? Um, at least a bushel. Okay. Right. It's it, a large amount. It a, yeah, exactly. It will addle your brain yeah. enough that someone would think you were possessed by Apollo. Right. But, but high fiber. <laughs> so by chewing on that, you um, yes, you get so, you have you enter kind of an altered state. And, okay, and so um, you know in the in the simple way that it's plausible that you know, in the sixties, you know, dropping acid is, right. is kind of a religious experience. And right? um, here I'm going to venture into something I know almost nothing about. Oh, go go for which it, which is both irresponsible and perhaps typical of academics. <laughs> uh, Native American rituals using is it uh, peyote? Peyote, yes. Right. So this is a um, it's an herb that is what it's burned in an enclosed setting Mm -hmm. and the smoke and steam that it emits has a mind altering quality. Yes. After which you are supposed to have closer contact with the divine. Uh, You go on your vision quest. Yes. Exactly. You meet your spirit animal. Correct. So that's the, that's the theory. Yeah. Now the other theory is geological rift. Right. And um, this is interesting. There's, there's been some geological study of the Mm -hmm. site that does show that there is a vein of natural gas that mm-hmm. runs underneath the temple. This is making me uncomfortable. <laughs> the, the, the gas part? You're going to riff on rift, is that right? <laughs> I wasn't going to, but okay. feel free to. No, go ahead. And so one of the theories is that this, if this vent, there was kind of a natural vent and in the she ground. Was, she was poised. The poised. Pythia was poised directly over it. Above it, right. And was, maybe that's one of the reasons she was she was elevated. Okay. And, and so she's inhaling these fumes. Methane? It's a, I, I guess. Okay. Yeah. Um, and that's also kind of altering her her state. And so I've also read the theory that that's one of the, that's the, one of the reasons or the reasons the Greeks thought this site was sacred. They were kind of wandering through this area, and in that spot, they felt a little weird. Right. They felt altered, and so that must be from the gods. Mm. And so let's come. Actually, there it. was an explanation. Right. And long story short, you you go from that to the Pythia inhaling these fumes and shrieking her oracles. I don't know. It's a I, I, so you're not sure what to believe. I'm not sure what to believe. Okay. Right? Yes. Yes or no. Supernatural. Um, I always. Like, yes or no. Winkle. Supernatural. I, I can't say yes or no. Okay. I can, so I will I, ask me. I leave the door. I leave the door open okay. to 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 that kind of thing. All yes, right. Uh, yes or no, Dave. What's the question? Supernatural. Yes. Yes. Really. Yes. Supernatural. Okay. And at the end of the episode, I'm going to bring in a scriptural reference. Which may not clinch the deal, but I think is highly suggestive. Okay, you've got a little card in your pocket. I got a card. Wait, I'm going to play. Well, excellent, right? No, I, I, I don't think that that you know, if the if the oracle didn't give good advice, it wouldn't have lasted what two thousand plus years. See right? that that is an argument that I find persuasive, but there's a good counter argument. Oh, yeah, and that is Wulgus Wult de Kippi, right? The mob wants to be deceived. Okay. So it doesn't matter how accurate it is. It was a pleasant excursion, which gave the appearance of reliability, and therefore people did it. Okay. Well, you can feel you can fool some of the people all the time, but you can't fool all the people all the time, right? So I. Yeah, I can even follow you there. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Good enough. All right. Um, so yeah, it's it's one of those tantalizing tantalizing mysteries. That, you know, what happened back there? How should we read it? How did the Greeks see it? Um, Let's leave it as a mystery. All right. Okay. All right. So right. I would just like to summarize. We've yes. got, we got the possession, which is the supernatural explanation, mm-hmm. uh, which you can't give a yes or no answer to, but I'm... I leave the door open to it. Okay. Right. Then we have um, hallucinogenic drugs, 
And then we have geologic shifting. Yes. Okay. Those that the, pretty much covers those it. Those are the main theories. Yes, All right. absolutely right. Now, what about answers from the Oracle? Right. So mo- the most famous ones show up in, uh, I mean, Herodotus was fascinated with Oracles. Yes. And, and so lots of these stories. And, and Herodotus is, is one of those historians where sometimes you have to take what he says with a grain of salt. I suppose. Yep. I like him. So the story of Croesus that we talked about. Yeah. You know, um, it's in Herodotus' these oracles there presented. They are riddles that have to be deciphered correctly. Croesus fails and destroys his own empire. Yes. Um, one of my favorite ones is this is this oracle that the Athenians received while they were uh, they had the, the Persians kind of coming upon them during the, the Persian War. Yeah, so the lead up, right, between between Marathon and Thermopylae, that 10-year stretch in yes. the four eighties. Right. And so the the Athenians are kind of bracing for the worst and, and kind of knowing that the Persians are coming and that they are if they don't do something, they are doomed. Uh, so they they send a, a delegation to to Delphi to ask the god what to do. Yes, and it's a complicated story. There's kind of a back and forth, but ultimately uh, the oracle comes and tells them, uh, if you're going to save yourself, you have to trust in famously the wooden wall. You have to trust in a wooden wall. Yes. Uh, may I digress for just a moment? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Did we do an episode on the events of Thermopylae? We did do two episodes. I think we did. Yeah. Have those been well received? Um, I think they're lagging a bit. I think people should, if you're listening, you should go back and, and, and listen to them. I thought they were very good. Could this be my attempt to guilt the audience into going to listen to oh, some guilt, previous episodes? Guilt away. <laughs> so these featured the work of Peter Green. That's right. Great historian. Right. Yeah. It was the brackish tang. It was where it came from. That's right. Okay. All right. Go back to the wooden wall. Right. So um, let me, I want to read uh, A.D. Godley's translation of this particular oracle. So that, again- You're not going to give us some hexameters? Um, I think in the interest of time, I think we're going to, we're going to, I'll get the translation. Do you want, you want to read some Greek? No, you got to do it, Jeff. This I do? Is, this is beautiful stuff. Let's hear it. Okay. I'll just give you a few lines. So this is in the hexameter, the same, you know, meter of, of Hesiod right. and Homer, right? Udunatai palas di Olympion ex ilasasthai. Lisomene poloisi logois kai meti di pukne. Soiditud auti se pose rio adamanti palasas. Very nice, Jeff. Very nicely done. Yes, that, that last line there, kind of uh, all uh, kind of pure hexameter. Yes, yes, lots of dactyls right. there. You want me to read a little bit of the translation, or would you like to do that also? Oh, I, I, I sense, a, sense a little indignation. Oh, I got over lots there. of resentment. Right. Let me tell you. Well, let me, let me ease that a bit. Go ahead and read some. Vainly does Pallas strive to appease great Zeus of Olympus. Words of entreaty are vain, and so too cunning counsels of wisdom. Nevertheless, I will speak to you again of strength at a mountain. Shall I go on? Yeah, please go. Okay. And, I'm sorry, all will be taken and lost that the sacred border of Kekraps holds in keeping today and the dales divine of Kithiron. Yet a wood-built wall will by Zeus all-seeing be granted to the Tritoborn, a stronghold for you and your children. I love how the, kind of the vast majority of that of those verses, it's pretty dark. It's like, right. there's no hope. You know, it's Athe- all done. Athena's uh, appealing to Zeus, but he's not listening. Right. However, there's a the, the wooden wall might grant you some safety. Yes. Yeah, so Pallas, right, is the goddess of, of Athens, obviously. Yes. So the oracle is put in terms of Athena, the tutelary deity of the city, appealing to her father Zeus. Right. And so then the question is, well, what does that mean? Right. What's the wooden wall? And so the Athenians debated. There was this wall that connected their harbor, the Piraeus, to the city. Yes. And so kind of the obvious answer was abandon the city and kind of hole up there. Yes. So this was the faction led by the followers of Miltiades. Yes. Because they believed, well, we beat the Persians at Marathon, yeah. right? Aristocratic hoplites. We can do it again anytime we want. So we'll crouch behind this wooden wall. Yeah. And Themistocles and company said, no, 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 no. It's more nuanced than that. Right. And so he says the wooden wall is not an actual wooden wall. Right. It's a metaphor. It's a metaphor and it's a reference to our ships. Yes. We have to build a navy. Yeah. And so they're putting all their chips in the in the ships. Yes. Chips in the ships. Ship, ships, <laughs> ship chips. Yes. <laughs> and in 10 years, they built an amazingly large navy and trained all of these men uh, to be rowers. Right. And gave birth to democracy, as we know. But now the wooden walls was still there on the Acropolis. This is in the Peter Green volume. Mm-hmm. Uh, but of course, the Persians just ran right over it right. and burned the Acropolis to the ground. Right. The city was destroyed. Yeah. Because mm-hmm. a wooden wall is not going to save anybody. No. No, exactly. So it's, uh, but the, the, of course, the Navy ultimately defeats the Persians at the Battle of Salamis. Correct. Uh, kind of the, one of the major turning points in ending that war. And in Western Civ. So yes. The abs- rest is history, as they say. Yep. So what about the uh, the response to Oedipus? This Oedipus, right. So Oedipus also goes to the Oracle when he's uh, kind of wondering about, you know, who, I, who am I? You right. Know, he learns that uh, there's rumors that he's been adopted. Yeah, he's in Corinth he's, uh, at, a, at a banquet, a drunk insults him so he flees Corinth 
Right into the hands of fate. Right into the hands of fate. And so um, he's thinking that you know the king and queen of Corinth were his mom and dad. Now he's not so sure. Right. So he goes to Delphi and basically he asks, you know, who am I? And the oracle tells him, you are the man who will murder your father and marry your mother. Yeah, Eka Homo. You're the one. You're the one. And so again, that 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 twist. He receives um, the most unexpected answer, perhaps. So that's also. Uh, we might say that's kind of a trope in the way these stories mm-hmm. are told. Mm-hmm. Um, but again, it, it does seem that many of the questions, maybe most of the questions were, uh, the, the Pythia just simply had to, she could shriek forth her glossolalia and the priest would say, mm, no. Right. Mm, yeah. Maybe. Maybe. Mm-hmm. Right. Something like that. And that, mm. would, but that certainly would have kept the line moving. Yes, right? okay. definitely. So well, a famous example of, of uh, kind of the yes or no answer is this this famous story of, about Socrates. Correct. Now well, we've told this before in brief, mm-hmm. right in the Gorgias episode. Yeah. How yeah. many ships will your face launch? Right. Right. But we got to tell it again. Yeah, it's a great story. Yes. So, um, and the most famous version of this comes from um, uh, Plato's Apology, where Socrates is on trial for his life, and he talks about his his friend Chirophon. He's a groupie. He's uh, Chirophon is a groupie. Chirophon's a groupie. Right. And Chirophon apparently went to Delphi to ask something along the lines: Is yeah. Is Socrates of Athens the wisest man of all? Well, it was more it was more nuanced, I think. He just wanted to settle the dispute, so he asked a non-loaded question. Who is the wisest oh, the, man okay. of all? Right. And the answer came back, Socrates. Socrates. So not ambiguous at all. Right. Right. Why is he the wisest man? Because he is the one that he's the only one who seems to know that he knows nothing. Exactly. Right. Probably most oracles, when they were asked, got yes or no answer, or just kind of the short one-word answer that would take care of it. My sense is that would probably, that makes more sense for... Rather than kind of these long dramatic hexameters mm-hmm. and, and the like, which can push the boundaries of believability. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But now from Dodona, we want to move on to Dodona. Yeah, please. Yeah. Now from Dodona, we have some more specific questions. Right. So at Dodona, this wonderful archaeological gift is they found all of these little lead strips. Yes. On which people would write their questions. Mm-hmm. And in that, that, you remember that wonderful little museum there. And I do. They have them up on the wall there. And so it's from Dodona we get um, much more so than ever from Delphi. Um, uh, some very specific questions that people asked, and they are they're wonderful because they're so they run from kind of the the grandiose to the mundane. Well, are you going to read some of them yes. to us? Or are you just going to keep teasing so us? So some like of them. This? So um, yeah. Th- so some of these lead strips. One says, um, "Who poisoned Aristovula?" Everybody wants to know right. who did it. Exactly. I, uh, I think it was Jimmy. Okay. <laughs> It's just my theory. All right. All right. Uh, one also says, uh, should I ask for citizenship now? Mm-hmm. Right? Okay. Or should I wait? Sh- should I wait? Right? Yeah, for a Black Friday sale or something. Yep. Lots of uh, along these lines. Uh, to which God should I pray in order that my business prospers? Mm-hmm. Right? So people want a little kind of boost, divine boost for their uh, for their you know wagon shop. Yeah, whatever. the next one I love. Yeah. <laughs> Who stole the sheet? <laughs> Who stole the sheet? <laughs> You wake up uncovered, right. and you want to know well, who stole it. That's right. It's, it's it, in my house. It's, it's my wife every time. Okay, it's, that's a little. What do they call that? What? TMI. Was it TMI? That's okay. TMI. That's right. well, I, I wonder. I, I would love to know. Let's move on. Okay. Let's let's move on. Okay. And then, um, uh, should I stay or should I go? Oh come on! No, it's there. This is made up. It is not. It's again. It's the Clash song. It might be even inspiration for the Clash. Song. Really? Right. Should I stay or should, should I, I go? go? Right. In which they say, you know, if I go, there will be trouble. If I stay, it will be double. Now that's from the Clash, also, the isn't clash. it? Right. So, it, which but is, that's a real that's a real question. I don't remember that one. Yes, exactly. Should I should I stay in this place or leave? Okay. Should I should stay or should I go? Right. It's a good question. You know, in that song, though, you know, if he stays, there will be trouble, or if he goes, there will be trouble. If he stays, he will be double. So you, you go, right? Is I would it, think so. It's simple, pretty easy. It doesn't doesn't seem to be much of a dilemma. Mm-hmm. Uh, take it up with uh, Joe Strummer. Okay. Right. Is that the uh, musician? Yeah, he's dead. But uh, right. all right, you promised you promised a a, a, a gospel. Trump card to kind of seal yeah, the deal? Yeah, yeah, a New Testament kind of uh, insight on this. Okay. And I want to just mention a couple of things as we wrap it up here. So John Milton wrote a poem that I like. Not a fan of Milton generally, but he wrote a poem called On the Morning of Christ's Nativity, Okay, in which he says, uh, answering the question, where did all the pagan gods and goddesses go? His answer is basically the advent of Christ drove them all away. Hmm. And that's why they're not around anymore. Okay. And it's quite a dramatic moment. Uh, I don't remember the exact words. Maybe we'll cover it sometime. But as the infant Christ lifts his uh, fist out of the cradle, Zeus and company, they all head for the hills because they know their time is up. So they they get out of there. Yes, they get out of Dodge, right? Because the real gods here, you know, the show's over and the counterfeits are done. Huh. Interesting. I find that a really compelling and and interesting uh, poem. It's beautiful. Hmm. So here's from Acts chapter 16, verses 16 and 17. So Mm -hmm. we covered this a little bit uh, in the episode. From there, they went to Philippi. Yeah. 
with uh, Ken Brat. Yes, yes. So again, it's a de porero menon, hemon estain, prasochain, pi discain tina echusan, pneuma puthona, who pantesai hemin. All right, so that's that's just that part there, which the ESV, as we were going to the place of prayer, we were met by a slave girl who had a spirit of divination. So that's how the ESV translates it. But you heard the word, right? Who had the spirit? Putho. Puthona, yeah. right? Had a, pytho. had a pytho, right? Yeah. She had a serpentine spirit. Hmm. So apparently Luke uh, and Paul believed that this was the real deal. Because look at what the spirit says. The spirit says, these men are servants of the most high God who proclaim to you the way of salvation. Hmm. So I think it's a, a good translation to say, she, as some translations do, she had a spirit of Apollo. Hmm. Yeah. So one way to explain the remarkable accuracy and longevity, right, of that oracle there is that it was demonic possession. It was a supernatural influence. Right. And I, I can't say it's a foolproof, uh, adamantin kind of argument, but I do think this passage is highly suggestive. And I can also say that through the, the majority of the history of the Christian church, theologians have interpreted the Greco-Roman gods as real creatures. Sure, sure, de- sure. Demonic creatures. Yeah. Now we're moderns, we don't believe anything, but, you know, that's that's what the church has believed traditionally. Right. No, I, I like this. I find that very persuasive. I think it also, you could also argue this fall, falls under the banner of what some is called like, like common grace, you know, mm-hmm. that, that um, you know, divine truth can come from you know, you know, many different places. So you're saying that the, the fact that the oracle wasn't always false can be a kind of providence. I think so. Yeah. I'd, I'd buy that. Yeah. I buy it too, although it's harder to square that with the concept of demonic origin. But oh. I mean, we're going to wade into theological waters here right. soon, but it, it, it is very, very interesting to yeah. me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a great way to, to end this. Okay, let's do it let's, then. Uh, we got to wrap let's this up. wrap it up. Yep. So before we leave, as always, we got some people to thank. Yeah, I'd like to thank Mishka. You are usually the one who thanks Mishka, yeah. just the way it works out. But thank you, Mishka, for putting all of this together. We're so grateful for your excellent work. You do such a nice job uh, handling all of the audio engineering of uh, these little efforts of yes, ours. Yes, we really appreciate it. Also, big thanks to our, our musicians, Ken Tamplin, Scott Vinzen. Uh, we're not worthy. No. <laughs> we, uh, we love the, the guitar shredding. and, and um, That's your Wayne's World reference it there? It is, exactly. Yeah, I got we're it. not worthy. All right. Yeah, love those guys. Um, so, listeners, uh, don't hesitate to contact us. We'd love to hear from you. Uh, drop us a note to, to Dave at Dave at adnauseum.com. Don't forget the V. Or to me, Jeff at adnauseum.com. Same deal. Um, let us know what you're thinking, what you like, what you don't like, what you want to hear. If you want to shout out, let us know a little bit about you. If you want to buy a limited edition sticker for three ninety nine, dollars yes. go to the website and lurch with merch. Yes, exactly. We'll sign our names to it or have some flacky do so. Write you a little note. Correct. Yeah. Yes. Uh, yeah. Get on it. Um, and you know, leave a review. Um, uh, vote for us on your your favorite platforms, iTunes thing, whatever, right? Whatever you listen to. This Jeff, on. what's coming up next week? Oh, it's huge! It's huge. Next week, where is our interview with the great Heather McDonald? Ah, yeah. It promises to be a rip roaring time, does it, it not? It is. Yep. Yeah. She's uh, a she's a, a intellectual heavyweight, definitely. And we'll do our best to keep up. Yeah, with the wit and charm. Yes, that she brings. Yeah. Yes. So you also get the gustatory parting shot. This yeah. week, do you not? Yes, and I'm, I think I've quoted from this guy before, one of my favorites, the great Jim Gaffigan. Let's hear it. And this is from his book, Dad is Fat. Oh, no. Right. So he says, in the end, that's what most vac- vacations are. Just you eating in a place you've never been. Why don't we eat something? And then we'll go get something to eat. Then we should see that thing we're supposed to see. They probably have a snack bar so we can get something to eat. But after that, we definitely got to go out and get something to eat. Yeah. Thanks for listening. Thanks. Thanks.